It was one of history's bloodiest battles. A clash between two legendary generals. It only lasted a single day, but it shaped the map of Europe for a century. Okay. I've always been interested in the story of Waterloo, especially since I played the role of Richard Shaw. Bang. A British rifleman in the Pontianic Wars. The South Essex will advance! Right shoulders forward! Mark! Sharp's adventures were based on real events that happened here 200 years ago. In these programs, I'll find out more about the men who inspired that character. These pictures are incredible. Not the generals who led the battle, but the ordinary soldiers who fought it. If that went through you, it'd smash you to pieces, well, wouldn't it? How would you discover their eyewitness Fire. accounts? and get a ground-level view of the battle that changed history. It is a ringing. <laughs> Test their weapons. Good. Excellent. We need modern-day soldiers. You know what it's actually like to fight for real. To actually hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. That's mm -hmm. a very sobering thought. Waterloo is one of the most famous names in the history of battle. I want to know what it was like to be here 200 years ago, the day history was made. My Waterloo adventure begins in Chatham, in the southeast of England. These history enthusiasts are rehearsing for a huge reenactment of the battle to mark its 200th anniversary. Some of them have ancestors who were there when the French army of Napoleon Bonaparte locked horns with an international force under the British general, Lord Wellington. It's pretty stirring stuff, that. Seeing all those uniforms kind of reminds you that it wasn't just the British, although they were the major kind of influence, but it's also the Dutch, the Germans, the Prussians, all fighting on the same side against Napoleon. It's loud, isn't it? Three months before Waterloo, Napoleon had escaped from exile. He'd been held on the island of Elba, after a 20-year quest to make France the top dog in Europe. Now he planned to attack Brussels in Belgium, where Wellington was assembling an army with his Prussian ally, General Blucher. The endgame played out a few miles to the south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. The battle that took place here was the first in history to be recorded in so much detail by so many soldiers. The eyewitnesses tell stories of incredible bravery. They reveal what it was like to be a soldier at Waterloo. They make sense of the chaos of war. Their stories will be my guide as I try to see the battle as they saw it at the time. And not just the fighting, but the waiting as well. On the night before the battle, the locals fled their villages as thousands of soldiers converged for the fight and wondered what tomorrow might bring. Private Tom Morris feared the worst, but his sergeant reassured him. Tom, he said, I'll tell you what it is. There is no shot made yet for either you or me. And it will be a sleepless night for the generals too. So this is Wellington's headquarters? Yeah, this is where he spent the night before the battle. Um, and it would have looked pretty much like this, Sean, actually. I suspect it hasn't yeah. changed that much. Wow, it's amazing to think he spent his last few hours in here, isn't it? Yeah, and you see the picture behind you there of Wellington on Copenhagen, his horse, and that's yeah. pretty much how he would have looked all the way through the battle the following day. Mm. We know, he knows he's got a long day ahead of him in the battle tomorrow, so, you know, there's a lot of thinking going on, and he did most of it in this room up here. So. Oh. So here we are in Wellington's HQ, Sean. Um, 
And this apparently was the room in which he spent his final night before the battle. Not necessarily on that bed, and of course they've got a depiction of him here. Wow. What do you think of the likeness? An amazing resemblance to Hugh Fraser who played Wellington <laughs> in Sharp. <laughs> really? It really does, yeah. I wonder if they modeled that from him. Like him. But actually, if you look there. from the side, Sean, you can see <laughs> the most distinctive feature of Wellington, that, of course, his is nose, his nose. Yeah. Hugh Fraser used to put a false one on every morning. I don't think he liked that very much. <laughs> really? yeah. It was necessary. Wow, it's amazing to think this is where Wellington spent the night before that battle and all, all that expectation of a nation on his shoulders. And this is where he was, yeah. There's a lot riding on the battlefield. But he has one big advantage, and the advantage is over here. Come and have a look at this, Sean. This is a copy, actually, of the actual map he used to plot the defensive position at Waterloo. But the story of the map's pretty amazing, actually, because even a year before the battle, Wellington ordered this map to be prepared. Why? Not because he necessarily thought he was going to face Napoleon, but because he wanted a military survey of the Netherlands. It was a place the British Army yeah. had fought many times in their history just in case. And when it was clear that Napoleon was back on the loose, he'd escaped from Elba, he instructed the work on this map to continue apace. And I don't know if you can see, it's stitched together from lots and lots of different pieces. Really? You mean like that? Exactly. Yeah. A different Royal Engineer officer would have been in charge of each of those sections. Eventually it was all put together in a hurry because he realized from the 16th onwards, when the fighting begins against the French, that he's probably gonna to have to fight a defensive battle against Napoleon. Two days before Waterloo, the French fought with the British at Quatre Bras, 10 miles further south, and with the Prussians at Ligny. They beat the Prussians and forced them back to the village of Wavre. The British retreated north to a better defensive position near the village of Waterloo. It was only now, less than 48 hours before the battle, that Wellington knew for sure where his showdown with Napoleon would take place. It's tiny Waterloo up there, isn't it? I mean, it's like, with all this big map and Waterloo's right up there on the edge. Well, it's lucky that you've still got a little bit on it that enabled him to use the, yes. the, these positions. Wellington must have been thinking the night before as he lay in this room that the possession of this map and the knowledge it gave him, it might just make the difference the following day. Yeah. While Wellington plotted, his men tried to rest. Most spent the night without shelter in the pouring rain. We were up to our knees in mud and stinking water, wrote army medic William Gibney. But not a drop of drinking water or a particle of food was to be found in the villages. We had to settle down in the mud and the filth as best we could. We got some straw and boughs off the trees, and with these, we tried to make a rough shelter against the torrents of rain that fell all night. And when morning came, Gibney and his mates would face the battle of their lives. Coming up next... Bang. I find out what damage Waterloo Musket can do. The bone is disintegrating on impact. The limb would have to be removed. teenager Matthew Clay. He wrote a journal about his experiences at Waterloo that his family still treasures today. So, uh, Christine, tell me about your ancestor, Matthew. Matthew was one of seven children. Age 18, he went down to London and joined the Third Foot Guards, the Scots Guards. Yeah. And then they had the orders that Napoleon was uh, on the move, so they all went over to, to Belgium. To Waterloo, yeah. yeah. They were all young men, weren't they? They were. In the early hours of June the 18th, Matthew and his comrades were ordered to report to the farm at Hugomont. He would spend the day defending these buildings from repeated French attacks and play a part in one of the battle's crucial turning points. But first, it was time to find breakfast. Well, they were absolutely starving. And then it tells you about, mm. um, about the food. The sergeant of each section gave a small piece of bread about an ounce. <laughs> so much no, is it? No, not when you're starving. <laughs> to each man, and inquiry was made along the ranks for a butcher. 
One having gone forward, he was immediately ordered to kill a pig, which having been slaughtered was divided amongst the company, a portion of the head in its rough state being my share, <laughs> and having placed it upon the fire, the heat of which served to dry out our clothing and accoutrements, and to cook our separate portion of meat, which having become warmed through and blackened with smoke, I partook of a little, but finding it too raw and unsavoury, having neither bread nor salt, I put the remainder in my haversack. <laughs> That's quite good. He, he, he did try it. it. Yeah, he did try it a bit later. Yeah. When he cooked it for a second time, I think there was uh, a part of a body, a human body, and with all the uh, bits of firewood and stuff, what you know, what they were cooking. So, it. but you, you just can't imagine that day. As Matthew packed his kit, he paid special attention to his musket. It had taken a soaking during the night. So he fired a test shot to check it was working. He knew his life would depend on it in the hours to come. I've used plenty of working replicas over the years, but I don't know how it feels to fire a genuine weapon in the heat of battle. But this man does. He's Corporal Chris Meek of the Rifle Brigade. So how long have you been in the Rifles, Chris? So I've been in the Rifles 10 years now, and I currently train new recruits who are joining the Rifles. Where's that? Is that you selling Catrick? Yeah, I've been Catrick, yeah. Before he became an instructor, Chris did three tours of duty in Afghanistan. He's joining me at the Royal Armouries in Leeds to see the weapons used by his predecessors at Waterloo. Oh, there's so many, so many rifles. <laughs> I've shot a few replicas in my time and make a lot of noise and look good, very well made, but to be surrounded by these rifles that have actually been shot is an anger. And to think that maybe your life or someone else has depended on it, it's quite scary, it's quite weird. Most of Wellington's infantry used muskets at Waterloo. I'm gonna find out what it's like to fire one of these original weapons, loaded with live ammunition. But first, it's time to meet an old friend. So I'm uh, putting the white gloves on now. So this must be the uh, the real McCoy, Mark. Absolutely. Let me hand you a Baker rifle, similar to the one uh, you would have been used to. Yeah, I've used replicas. It was on Sharp. That's quite different. <laughs> I feel very, uh, it's very slim, isn't it? Very sleek. Uh, it's much, I don't know, it seems heavier, but it's very mu much finer, much slimmer kind of gun. And Chris, here is a musket of the same period. Very front heavy, isn't it? I mean, to get it into a fire position, it feels quite heavy at the front, so it'd be quite a strain on your arm. So, uh, yeah, I can't quite remember these sights. Ah, oh, but the 1805 model, which is the one you're handling, was fitted with folding sights, so you could yeah. have two different uh, Good, distances to aim at. You see this, Chris? Do you know yeah. what that's for? No, no idea. You can get it open. So we put the, uh, I think the patches, wasn't it? Absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, patch, of course, is a little square bit of uh, cloth which you can wrap around your musket ball, which allows you to uh, load it with a very tight fit. And that, that's ready to go in. It would be, yes. I've had some powder in it. <laughs> <laughs> Bang. Brilliant. Mark and his team of weapon experts have been testing their Waterloo guns to find out how deadly they were. They're firing live ammunition into materials that mimic the density and composition of human flesh, muscle and bone. We hope that we'll be able to show the type of wounding that a flintlock musket ball can cause. These slow motion images are shocking. It's showing quite clearly that the bone is disintegrating on impact. The limb would have to be removed. There is no bone left. Terrifying, really. You can see the bone flexing yeah, as the as bullet it, as approaches. It's approaching. I feel a bit sick. <laughs> that is absolutely horrific. You don't want to get hit by this. The power of a musket is terrifying at close range. But 
How easy was it for a soldier like Matthew Clay to hit his target? Who better to test their accuracy than a modern army sharpshooter? The India pattern musket weighs almost exactly the same as a modern army combat rifle. So adopt the kneeling position, just as you normally would. But the Waterloo weapon was notoriously unreliable. If the mechanism got wet, the gun might not fire at all, as Matthew Clay would later discover to his cost. Good shot. That is actually, in the right circumstances, <laughs> with the, the right man. Yeah, strong shoulder. <laughs> you can hit the target. What was that like? It's quite a, quite a recoil on it, a lot more than what I'm used to, yeah. Yeah, it's a not like boom, isn't it? Yeah, and the, the smoke cloud after. Yeah. You take a couple of seconds to see if you actually hit the guy. <laughs> That's a pretty good shot, eh? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. What if I can do with it? Yeah, it's all go now, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, drop down. Get comfortable. Nice and stable. I keep the uh, muzzle pointing down the range at all times now, because it is loaded. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Pulling it well into the shoulder, because this does kick. Yeah. And then the last step, is make ready, which means you bring that to full cock. That's it. Right. Right. Fire. Oh. <laughs> it is a very strong trigger. Dread that is, isn't it? Right, just let me get. Good. Excellent. So you hit what you're aiming at. Yeah, it's quite a big blast, isn't it? So how does that compare to firing a blank charge? On it's a, different, on TV, yeah, so. very different, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. much more of a, an, an impact, you know, with all your senses around you. I, I should imagine in those days when they were firing stuff like that and there was maybe hundreds or thousands going off, it must have been just kind of, the, the air must have just been resonating with the sound. And, uh, it's hard to imagine the noise, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's just off the paper, but the human body is a lot bigger than a piece of paper. So you've, you know, that's killed your target. Yeah. The target is dead. Coming up next, the battle begins, and I'm roped in to join a Waterloo War. I'm finding out what it was like to be a soldier at Waterloo 200 years ago, and now I'm heading for one of the key locations on the battlefield. We are going to take a very bad road right in the middle of the field. My guide is George Jacobson. He's involved in a charity that's restoring the historic buildings at Hougamont Farm. The day before the battle, it, there have been dreadful rains like we have had yes. this morning. It's probably similar to the yeah. conditions to what, yeah. <laughs> so out what it is today. Imagine having to drag massive cannons through, through this sludge. You see, that's Hougamont appearing there. To understand why Hougamont was so important, you need to know about the rest of the battlefield too. Napoleon's forces were massed in the south. Wellington's troops faced them from the high ground to the north. This ridge was a strong defensive position. It allowed Wellington to hide many of his troops, making it hard for the French to target their artillery. And French infantry and cavalry would have to climb a steep slope to reach the enemy. Wellington also controlled the farm at La Haye Sand and the buildings at Hugomont, where Matthew Clay was stationed. From here, the Allies could shoot crossfire and disrupt the flow of Napoleon's attacks. If Wellington kept control of these outposts, he had a good chance of holding off the French until his Prussian allies arrived from the east. It looks like a building site while the restoration happens, but you can understand why Wellington thought it crucial to defend this place, whatever the cost. So this looks quite an impressive uh, building. You can see why Wellington put so much importance on it as a stronghold. Quite an impressive building indeed. There was the farm and the barn here. This was always Wellington's tactics to try to hide part of his troops. And when he discovered two days before the battle that there was this place, he prepared it as a sort of fortress. 
This was where the battle finally began in earnest. Wellington had posted some of his best troops to defend the farm. The buildings were surrounded by other obstacles that made this a difficult place for the French to capture. More Allied soldiers were positioned in the walled garden and orchard to the east. And there was a large wood to the south, defended by some of Wellington's German troops. In the late morning, the French began to fight their way through the woods. Within an hour, they had the farmhouse buildings in their sights. Only a few trees from the original wood are still standing here today. So these trees, these would, these are the edge of the wood? Absolutely. And then from here to there, there's nothing. Nothing. It's just an open space. And Wellington made in the wall some holes yeah. to allow the troops that were inside to shoot at the French that would come out of the woods. So yeah. nobody could possibly pass this stretch of open field. They had no chance. No the chance. French, did they? No. Private Johann Leonard, one of the Allied troops defending Hugomont, described what happened next. We had hardly taken up position at the loopholes when masses of French came out of the wood, apparently all set to capture the farm, but they were too late. A shower of balls that we loosed off on the French was so terrible that the grass in front was soon covered with French corpses. You can still see a hole of a bullet that was shot at that time. Yeah. And which is impressive to, to think that those trees <laughs> have been witnesses of the heavy fighting that has been taking place here. This is quite a fortress, this, this side of the farm. You can imagine the English with their muskets through those holes. You want them to be a Frenchman attacking this. Unable to break through the south gate, the French turned their attention to the west side of the buildings, where Matthew Clay was stationed with a hundred of his mates. They were heavily outnumbered, but as he tried to retreat back inside the farm, Matthew found himself stranded outside. To make matters worse, his musket was misfiring. He was forced to swap it for another one that lay by the body of a dead comrade. As Matthew later recalled, the new weapon was still warm from recent use and an excellent one. At least it gave him a fighting chance of making it out alive. Meanwhile, less than a mile to the south, near an inn called La Belle Alliance, Napoleon was aiming his sights at the heart of Wellington's defences. So all the Allies would be right along that ridge line. Absolutely, and pretty much where you can see the houses there, you see the road going through them. Yeah. That's the centre of Wellington's position. He'd have had troops arranged on both sides, about a mile actually on both sides. But yeah. the bulk of Wellington's army is the other side. And the reason he's got them the other side is because what Napoleon is sighting in this position we're actually on here. From where we are, for a total of about a thousand yards, we're sighted cannon after cannon after cannon after cannon. Napoleon loved his cannons. He'd risen through the ranks as an artillery officer, and he knew how brutally effective his so-called beautiful daughters could be. What Napoleon actually wants to do is use these cannon to wear down the enemy. To just bludgeon them. Yeah, it's literally bludgeoning. Yeah. But there's a problem he's got on the day of the Battle of Waterloo, and this is the clue to the problem. If you just yeah. have a look ahead of me here, Sean. I mean, look at, look at this. Completely God, yeah. waterlogged. This, this soil yeah. uh, has taken an That's awful lot of, lot of rain in the last 24 hours or so, yeah. and it's pretty much identical to what would have happened prior to Waterloo, because for the uh, 24 hours or so, before it, it's just been non-stop rain. Yeah. And the problem with soil like that is you can't manoeuvre guns in it. I've been roped in to help move a replica cannon into position. You can see the problems of moving this gun on a relatively dry day. This is Jim Paley. He was a major in the Royal Artillery and is an expert on Waterloo cannons. Yeah. It's heavy, it's hard work. It's hard work. Waterloo artillery was much heavier than this. Oh, it's a big hole yeah. to move through the mud. Pull. So Napoleon hey, faced an agonizing it. way for the ground to dry before he could get his cannons up and running. But the clock was ticking. 
He wanted to break through Wellington's defences before nightfall. And finally, he could wait no longer. Just before noon, he ordered his cannons to open fire. Gun captain, when you're ready, the first thing the attachment commander is going to do is order the gun to be wormed. The worm, wormer, is a big corkscrew. He's going to put that down the barrel and turn it to make sure there's nothing inside there. That will pull out any debris. The worm it? Worm it. It's called oh, worm right. it. It's not a funny word to this, isn't it? <laughs> like worm. You'll notice how he uses it underhand. If something's yeah. going to go off, if you have your hand on the top, yeah. then you're going to lose your arm. The next right. job that's going to happen is a sponge man who is going to wet his sponge will now ram down the barrel and that will extinguish any embers. If the embers weren't put out, the cannon could explode as it was being reloaded. Working at the business end of a Waterloo gun is no job for the faint-hearted, even when it's just a replica. So you can now give it real welly. And if you don't ram this properly, it's not going to fire. And everyone will think you're a big girl, OK? Napoleon had over 250 cannons at Waterloo, 100 more than Wellington. When the barrage began, the thunder of the guns could even be heard in Brussels, 10 miles from the battlefield. Now, if you do that three times a minute, you're going to win. Bloody hell. The heat of the moment, that must have been very kind of difficult just to keep your concentration. And when it went off, and then they got... <laughs> Incredibly loud. Oh, that's amazing, that. My ears are ringing. <laughs> a well-drilled gun crew could fire at a rate of three rounds a minute. I wonder how long it'll take for the new recruit. Gun battery, three rounds, independent, rapid, fire! In the first half hour of the battle, Napoleon launched 3,000 cannonballs at the British lines. Yeah. It was a shock and awe tactic to demoralise the enemy before he sent in his infantry and cavalry to finish the job. Haven't done any yet. First gun finished, timekeeper. I think I must have uh, put, washed it out with a sponge and left too much water in it. Yes! That was just our first round. We managed three shots in the end. But Napoleon would not right. have been impressed. Number four gun finish. Timing for the first gun finish, please. Two minutes, 50 seconds for the first gun. Timing for the last gun. Nine minutes. Sir. Nine minutes. It wasn't my fault the gunpowder didn't fight. <laughs> it's one thing playing soldiers with a replica, the genuine Waterloo cannons were no laughing matter. We persuaded the Royal Armouries to let us fire this 200-year-old gun using live ammunition. We're testing it on an army-approved range on Salisbury Plain, under the supervision of weapons expert Nicholas Hall. This cannon dates from about 1800, so it was in use at the time of Waterloo. I think that could go over the top. Yeah. Simon West trained as an artillery officer with the British Army. He's fascinated by the experiences of his predecessors at Waterloo. Well, I think we've got a very rare opportunity today to actually see the weapon effects that were delivered by the Royal Horse Artillery at Waterloo. After the French cannons opened fire on Wellington's Ridge, the Allied artillery was eager to fire back. I reckon that's pretty good. Okay. But Wellington said no. He wanted to save his ammunition to use at closer range against foot soldiers and horses. I'm optimistic we're going to hit this. This will be the first time in 200 years this cannon's been fired with a full charge of powder and a six pound round shot. They'll watch the action from the safety of the control tower and high speed cameras will record the result. Paul Seaton and Mandy Chesterton had ancestors who fought in the Waterloo gun troop. They're about to see what happened when their three times great grandfather, bombardier Nathaniel Almey, was finally given the signal to fire. Okay, firing in five, four, three, 
two, one. The sheer velocity of these weapons spread carnage across the battlefield. That ball was traveling at a couple of hundred meters a second and would have created havoc in the enemy lines. One well-aimed shot could rip through a column of infantry and kill as many as 20 men. Our cannonball finally ended its journey 300 meters from where the shot was fired, and it took a small hillside to stop it. Wow. Wow. So that's a good three feet in. Yep. It's a solid chalk. If, if that was a, a French cavalryman approaching it, obviously it would have gone straight through him. In the first exchanges of battle, Wellington ordered his artillery to hold fire. But now their time had come, because down in the valley, the French infantry was about to attack. Coming up next, fighting fire with fire. It's not something you think about turning and running. No. No. We stand now and fight. It's early afternoon on the 18th of June, 1815. The Battle of Waterloo has raged across this valley for nearly two hours. Napoleon's cannons are battering the ridge held by Wellington and his allies. The British general is desperate to stand his ground until the Prussians arrive. But the farmhouse at Hougoumont is also under attack by the French. And the British teenager Matthew Clay is stranded outside with one of his mates. It was with Private Gann, and Matthew says nice things about him, saying it, it, it was his senior. Them two got stuck outside the gates, and it weren't till one of the officers come in, they opened the gates up, and they managed to get in. It was a narrow escape. Moments later, a mob of French soldiers, some wielding axes, began to smash the gates. Matthew's journal describes the desperate efforts of his comrades to keep them out. I saw Lieutenant Colonel McDonnell carrying a large piece of wood or trunk of a tree in his arms, one of his cheeks marked with blood. His charger lay bleeding within a short distance with which he was hastening to secure the gates against the renewed attack of the enemy, which was most vigorously repulsed. According to Wellington, the heroic effort of Macdonald and his men made the difference between victory and defeat at Waterloo. Barring the gates against the French ensured this crucial outpost stayed in British hands, and Matthew was there when history was made. These are the famous north gates of Hougoumont. It's where the French broke through, where the British repelled them. 200 years ago, this courtyard would have been a place of horror. A handful of French soldiers, trapped inside when the gates closed behind them, were put to the sword by the British. Such a scene of bayonet work I never before or since beheld. One of the British soldiers wrote later, we look like so many butchers red with gore. But amidst the carnage, Matthew Clay performed an act of mercy that saved the life of one French intruder. The enemy's artillery having forced the upper gates, a party of them rushed in who were as quickly driven back, no one being left inside but a drummer boy without his drum, whom I lodged in a stable or outhouse. This drummer boy, you were only, what, you, what 13? Oh, crying, yeah. And he, you, Matthew, managed to get him safe. He, he put did, him somewhere yeah. safe. These drummer boys could be anything from like 11, 12 yeah. year old. Yeah. And you can't little, imagine yeah. that young lad being stuck inside doors when all these other the French yeah. are dead and yeah. he's here uh, like, what Wait, do I do? Witness to that, yeah. I should be proud of him. I am very <laughs> proud of him, <laughs> Sean. Yeah. 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 These lads who fought at Waterloo, it's, it's nice to keep the memory. The French would continue their efforts to capture Hugomont for hours to come. But time was running out for Napoleon, because Wellington's Prussian allies were getting closer to the battlefield. The Prussians were marching through mud from the east. 
It would be hours before they were able to join the battle. And if they made it before nightfall, they could reinforce Wellington's troops on the ridge and also attack Napoleon's forces from the south. If they didn't arrive in time, the French had every chance of breaking Wellington's line. It had been battered by artillery for two hours, and now the French infantry was ready to mount its first attack. So, Sean, sure, we're following in the direction of the first major French attack yeah. the day of the Battle of the Waterloo. The, the cannons at the Grand Battery on the ridge behind us have been softening up the Allied line ahead. And now yeah. it's time to send the infantry in, and they're sending them in in these massive columns. The mm. French always attack in columns because it's easier to manoeuvre that way. And there's also the psychological effect of the defenders seeing this huge mass of troops. How many yeah. men? 2,000 men in a single column. And there's a block here, another one there, and another one over there. And these three massive columns with the head of the column 48 men wide. So it's all covered, all, all this field is well, it's covered by thousands and thousands of men. All you can see are men, as far as the eye can see, in these solid blocks. And it must have seemed to the defenders on the ridge that they were going to be completely unstoppable. Yeah. Now, cannon are firing at them, so they're taking casualties, these, these columns, but that's not making any difference to them. They're so well disciplined. The men are just falling out, the injured and the, and the killed, and they're carrying on, they're closing up ranks. Slowly but surely, they're getting towards the Allied positions up on the ridge there. Now, up there, just on the ridge lines, we can see ahead of us, there's a big block of uh, Netherlands soldiers, 2,000 of them, put in front of, rather unfairly, I think, by Wellington, in front yeah. of the ridge line, and they were the first point of defense. And as these massive columns were getting closer and closer and closer, the Netherlanders were getting more and more spooked. And when they got really close, they just up sticks Did they? And, and left. And they just stream on back through the British line, and all you've got left now are the British soldiers. And the question yeah. is, are they going to be enough to stop the French breaking through the line? His forces were outnumbered, but Wellington trusted his infantry more than any other part of his army. Now was the time to find out if he was right. These reenactors are practicing the drills that made Wellington's infantry such a formidable foe, under the guidance of former Army Rifles Major Rob Ewell. To find out how they prepared for battle, I'm joined by serving soldiers from the Coldstream Guards. Their predecessors fought at Waterloo. So Rob, I'm just imagining I'm a French soldier, one of the infantry. I've got thousands of my mates each side of me, used to winning. And uh, just going up that hill, I wonder what Wellington's got in store for us on the other side. Yeah, well, um, not what Napoleon's expecting. Napoleon is used to winning against the conscript forces of the European armies and he's expecting his artillery barrage has already demoralised the enemy forces so that when you crest the ridge line, you're going to be able to deploy into line um, and destroy the enemy in front of you who are already on the point of breaking. However, you're facing the British army, which is the only professional army in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars uh, and which is incredibly well drilled. So, Charlie, this is... Uh... I guess it's nothing new to you, modern day soldier drill. When we're in the field, when we fight, we employ at the very lowest level drills. And so a section battle drill en encompasses everything that you do from the moment you come under fire through to fighting through and clearing the enemy position. It's a one word of command from which a number of actions happen. And it's, it's the same as we see here. And it's, it's designed to remove conscious thought because the yeah. people will be tired, they'll be scared, they'll be under pressure, there'll be a lot of noise and distractions. And if you can have something sort of almost in your muscle memory that you've practiced and practiced and practiced. It means you don't have to uh, think. So we're like uh, modern day robots. Everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah. Just gets on with it. So I think the minute we don't do it is when something goes wrong. Yeah. And when it all goes belly up, yeah. that individual that's seen something forgets what he's doing as that drill will cost their lives. So with the drill, how does that help you cope with fear? How, how do you address that? It's the fear that keeps you sparking. Yeah. It, it's the thing that makes you look out for disturbed uh, command-wise and oh. things like, things like Wait, the out, out of the ordinary. It's that fear that, that keeps that in the back of your mind all the times. And it works in hand in hand with the drills Wait, as well. Ready. Because if you if you sort of be a bit blase about the fear, you then become slack on the drills. Like we alluded to earlier, and that's when mistakes start to get made and things start to go wrong. 
I think the, 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 there's definitely a coercive aspect as well because you know, fear is again it's directional. You know, are you more are you more frightened of the enemy or are you more frightened of the consequences of turning and running? And if the consequences of turning and running are some horrible sergeant with a big pike standing behind you, um, yeah, I mean the, the army of 1815 was a flogging army, um, yeah. and our regiment was particularly fond of the lash. You read the punishment book. There was Soldier absent from camp for an afternoon, 350 lashes. You know, that, this is not an army that yeah. tolerates Wait, people turning and running. Yeah. So actually the threat in front of you is almost less than the threat behind you. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah. you know, mates Wait, around I'm you, not... it's, you know, as it is today, you've got other people depending on you. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It's not something you think about turning and running. No. It's, well, we don't, do we? No. We stand there and fight. Make ready! The firepower of a single well-drilled infantry unit is impressive enough. If you multiply that by a hundred, it's terrifying. As Napoleon's troops got closer to the ridge, many of their comrades had already fallen victim to the rapid, continuous fire of Wellington's men. Others had been killed or maimed by artillery, but still they marched forward through the trampled crops. The French column is now reaching the front line of the uh, Allied position, the famous sunken lane, which you can see just here. It was actually slightly steeper oh, 200 years say, ago. It looks quiet. <laughs> it looks quite, quite benign, doesn't it? But there, there, was, it? there was quite a little uh, bank just beyond it, and on top of the bank was a, a big thorn hedge. So they had to scramble their way through the thorn hedge, which is disrupting their formation a little bit. And then all of a sudden, what greets on the other side is the chilling sight of lines of British infantrymen, and behind them, a mass of cavalry. I've seen the terrible damage a single musket can inflict. Now both sides were firing off thousands of rounds a minute at close quarters, and the cannons were still firing too. Artillery officer Alexander Mercer describes the chaos of the battlefield. The air was suffocatingly hot resembling that issuing from an oven. We were enveloped in thick smoke, and despite the incessant roar of cannon and musketry, could distinctly hear around us a mysterious humming noise, like that which one hears on a summer's evening, proceeding from a myriad of beetles. Cannon shot too, ploughed the ground in all directions, and so thick was the hail of balls and bullets but it seemed dangerous to extend an arm, lest it should be torn off. Next time, Huzzah! he tests the swords of Wellington's horsemen. Took his ear off. <laughs> I get to grips with Waterloo surgery. Push so. hard and back gently. And find out why this battlefield discovery is unique. To actually hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. It's mm -hmm. a very sobering thought.